without further ado, I would like to welcome up Tom Flynn of the Council for Secular Humanism, one of my favorite authors and a formidable foe of Christmas and probably Easter too. Down with Easter, here we go. But up now with Tom Flynn. I'm told that happy 420 is in order. I don't know what that means. Well, it's great to be here. Uh, you know, as some of you know, about three blocks down the street is the world headquarters from a, of a particular organization that's in the business of, I believe it's called religion. And I thought perhaps we might talk about it just a little bit. I mean, we had a very stimulating panel this morning. I'm the first solo speaker after the panel discussion. Now, I guess somebody had to do the Sunday morning sermon. <laughs> and so I'd like to begin with a reading from the Book of Mormon. That's really in there, Moroni 1024, prophecy to live by. Now here's another brief Sunday morning reading. Mormonism must be done away with by the thousand influences of civilization, by education, by the elevation of the people. Well, that didn't happen. The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints has come a long way since the great agnostic could recommend to a newspaper reporter that the influences of civilization should simply sweep it away. Of all the creeds to emerge from 19th century America, only Mormonism shows serious prospects of becoming a world religion. Starting from a handful of enthusiasts 184 years ago, there are now about 14 million Mormons worldwide. Now what does that mean that this creed that took shape in a New York village in the early 1800s would attract pioneer adherents willing to suffer so much for a creed that in the eyes of others was so transparently born of chicanery? What does it mean that today contemporary Mormons draw identity and meaning from a church that so little resembles the one Joseph Smith inaugurated in 1830. Between 1830, when Joseph Smith published the Book of Mormon, and 1869, when some 70,000 pioneers had joined Brigham Young in Utah, the religion we know as Mormonism was spun out of absolutely nothing. Smith, Young, and a handful of others made it all up. They did it in this country, in our language, in plain view of journalists and critics. Mormonism is the only world religion that historians can trace right back to the womb. That fascinates me, so much so that though I've never been Mormon, I consider myself a Mormon junkie. That's one reason I wrote a series of black comedy science fiction novels with Mormon themes. My favorite reviews are the ones that assumed I must be an angry ex-Mormon. And not, not only can you buy those, they also have the Council for Secular Humanism's new four-part video series, American Free Thought, which I executive produced. So we'll see you all after this talk. Well, in these books, one of my principal villains is a bumbling Mormon televangelist. Here's how I wrote his sermons. You've probably heard about Christian inspirational writers who close their eyes, open the Bible to a random page, and drop their finger. Where it points, that's what they write about. So I did the same thing. <laughs> with a Book of Mormon. Two times out of three, wherever my finger landed, I found something funny. 
And that's in a current edition, the Book of Mormon you can steal out of the nightstand at any Marriott hotel. If you want real wackiness, go back to the first edition, the Book of Mormon printed for Joseph Smith in this modest print shop in Palmyra, New York in 1830. The one that dispenses with all that pretense about Joe having translated the scripture and goes all out and just credits him as the author. Who's seen, the, who's seen the famous South Park episode about how Joe Smith founded his church? Here's the secret. It's almost all true. Aside from a little artistic, visual artistic license and a little compression in the storytelling, the South Park guys presented Joe Smith's story pretty much as it happened. Basically, they didn't exaggerate because they didn't have to. The truth is ludicrous enough. <laughs> Young Joseph Smith, a New York farm lad who used to ask his neighbors to pay up front so he could try and fail to dig up magical buried treasure on their lands, entered this grove to ask God which was the true religion. Bruce, we should have music here. <laughs> he says an angel came to him to declare that no existing religion was true, no the real religion was contained in a set of gold plates buried by a long-ago hero in the New York hillside where tens of thousands of warriors once met in an apocalyptic battle. His name was Moroni, and all things pertaining to him would henceforth be known as... Well, never mind. <clears throat> Young Joseph translated the golden plates without actually looking at them, by focusing on a set of seer stones in his hat. I told you, satire cannot top the actual claims. When young Joseph's scripture was completed, and trust me, I'm leaving out layers of soap opera that would do a Mexican telenovela proud, <laughs> he persuaded a prosperous local farmer to pledge part of his farm to fund the printing of what would be the Book of Mormon. Now, the Book of Mormon corrected what 19th century Americans saw as Christianity's most baffling omission, its failure to include the new world and its peoples. The new scripture told of a band of Jews who fled Jerusalem before its destruction by the Babylonians in the 6th century BCE. They built a most remarkable ship, a ship sealed so tight that it could dive beneath the waves. Yet, as shown here, it also had an open foredeck. So I guess all things are possible with God. Anyway, this great ship crossed the Atlantic and deposited its occupants in the promised land we know as America. Shortly after arriving, the newcomers divided into two competing nations, the Nephites and the Lamanites. They would spend the next six centuries fighting each other and ignoring one holy prophet of God after another. Finally, shortly after his resurrection, Jesus Christ appeared to the Book of Mormon peoples and shared his teachings with them, especially the one about how if they were very, very good, one day they could be as white as he is. <laughs> Not long afterwards, the Nephites and the Lamanites forgot what Jesus had taught them the same way they forgot what all the other prophets had tried to teach them, and they met in a climactic battle in what is now West Central New York State, just north of Interstate 90. Almost everyone died, neatly solving the problem of how come none of the Native Americans actually existing in the early 19th century remembered any of this. Two notable survivors were Mormon, the Nephite commander, and his human hat rack. I mean, his son, Moroni. Near death, Mormon gave his son the tribal chronicles inscribed on plates of gold. Moroni would later become the angel who supposedly revealed the plates to Joseph Smith. That's the story the Book of Mormon told, but there's a more remarkable story that unfolded where the scripture was first printed, at the shop of Egbert Grandin in Palmyra. Grandin had other customers, notably Abner Cole, a Rochester freethinker who edited Palmyra's weekly paper under the pseudonym of Obadiah Dogberry. You can't make this stuff up. 
Grandin needed weeks to set and print the Book of Mormon. It was a vast project. And each Sunday night, Dogberry would come in to read the proofs of his newspaper, and he'd find new pages of the Book of Mormon drying all down the aisle. Shortly before the Book of Mormon was published, Dogberry's paper ran a 16,000-word expose. Challenging Book of Mormon claims at length, quoting long passages without permission, and engaging in pointed satire. Dogberry's was the first lay critique of Smith's new scripture, and many of its objections are still upheld by contemporary scholars. For this reason, the Grandin Print Shop holds a unique distinction today. It's the only property in all of the United States which is simultaneously a museum operated by the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints and a stop on the Council for Secular Humanism's Free Thought Trail. In any case, whether Obadiah Dogberry's expose had much to do with it or not, the Book of Mormon was not commercially successful as Joseph Smith had hoped it would be. His principal backer, Martin Harris, wound up having to sell off 151 acres of his farm to pay the printer's bill. But if Joseph Smith had failed as an author, he found another way to succeed. He launched a religious community based on Book of Mormon teachings. This so alarmed the neighbors that they promptly ran the community out of the area. That would happen a lot. <laughs> Amid some hardship, the community moved to Kirtland, Ohio, just outside of Cleveland, where it raised its first temple. There, Smith proclaimed the word of wisdom, a revelation forbidding the use of tobacco, coffee, and tea. Smith's wife, Lucy, had complained about having to clean up tobacco chaws spat out onto the temple floor after each revelation meeting. Smith obliged by forbidding to, well, pardon me, he got a revelation from God, <laughs> forbidding tobacco, but then he, or God, retaliated by forbidding the coffee and tea so loved by the women folk. And yep, that's where the word of wisdom comes from. Sure enough, the sect got run out of Kirtland also. After various misadventures and yet greater hardships, Smith and his followers lighted in Nauvoo, Illinois, where the ambitious prophet raised a village beside the Mississippi River. Here the church raised its mightiest temple yet. Here too, Joseph Smith first secretly instituted polygamy and introduced such classic Mormon tropes as the notion of a huge walk-through baptismal font carried on the backs of a dozen solid American oxen representing somehow the 12 tribes of Israel. You, you can't make this stuff up. Soon the prophet had styled himself Lieutenant General Joseph Smith. He commanded a city militia more powerful than the state militia of Illinois. Smith laid plans to run for president of the United States. He also sent thugs to destroy the office of a town newspaper that had exposed his plural marriages. For that, Smith and a few key associates were jailed in nearby Carthage, Illinois, and quickly attacked by a mob. They defended themselves, but to no avail. Smith plunged through a window to his death, thrusting the foundling religion into its first crisis of succession. Brigham Young took control of a church once more surrounded by hostile locals. Young decided that the Mormons must abandon Nauvoo, venturing far into unsettled lands where there would be no Gentile neighbors to take offense at their strange and enterprising ways. They would strike out for Utah territory, though that would entail hardships of a scope the Mormons had never imagined. On arriving at Salt Lake Valley, Brigham Young, he's the one who's not walking, declared, this is the place, and one of the most genuinely extraordinary migrations in the history of the American West drew to a close. Many Mormon pioneers had died along the way, martyrs to their new faith. Today, Latter-day Saints often point to the pioneers' resilience and determination as proof that their religion must be true, which is kind of strange because we know it's all bullshit. 
After years of study, I am satisfied that Joseph Smith first invented his homespun faith as a conscious fraud, a con game, a scam. Only later, perhaps as late as when the Mormons arrived in Nauvoo, did he come to believe in his own messianic pretensions. For proof, we need look no further than the original Book of Mormon, the one printed under the prophet's own direction in 1830. Does it read more like the word of God or like the fakery of a rural lad who'd grown up with little more than the King James Bible on the family bookshelf? What are we to make of errors in language like Alma and Helam was buried, and the priests was not? They did not fight against God no more. That all might see the writing which he had wrote Teach repentance and baptism unto they. And this thing had not ought to be. I'll agree with that. <laughs> Behold, I were about to write them all. So illiterate, so flawed was the Book of Mormon that as early as 1965, a scholarly survey revealed that there had been 3,913 changes since the first edition. Some of these represented changes in doctrine, others were needed just to bring the document to minimal standards of literacy. And of course, there have been further revisions since. 1965 was just the only time I know of that anybody had the intestinal fortitude to count them all. So much for Joseph Smith's claim that the Book of Mormon was the most correct of any book on earth. And yet, and yet, the saints believed. They suffered. Some died. They accepted intrusive control over their lives at the hands of their church. They made all these demonstrations of commitment, even though we know with psychological and historical certainty that the faith they believed in was false. In other words, we have proof. Proof from our own nation, in our own language, spelled out in documents that any of us can read Proof that being radically, foundationally untrue does not prevent a creed from blossoming into a world religion. If the psychology is right, a creed that is 100% baloney can engage with adherents and grow up to be one of the world's major faiths. We know it can happen because the Mormon Church has done it and is still doing it before our eyes. If such a thing could happen among 19th century Americans who were moderately educated, who knew something about science and something more about standards of evidence, then why couldn't the same thing have happened among the downtrodden of the first and second century Mediterranean world? If today's Mormon colossus could grow from nothing but a tissue of lies, then it's possible to account for the growth and behavior of organized Christianity, too, without needing to imagine that the stories told about its origins are true. Christian apologists have long insisted that Jesus must have been the Son of God, he must have worked his miracles and been resurrected from the dead, and so on, because so many of the apostles and other early Christians accepted martyrdom rather than betray their faith. Why would anyone do that, this argument goes, if these earliest Christians did not know with the certainty that only direct experience can bring that their beliefs were factually correct? Well, actually, historians now suspect that the number of early Christian martyrs has been greatly exaggerated. But this argument remains enormously influential. Among its prominent exponents today is William Lane Craig, America's foremost Christian debater. In one of his podcasts, Craig demanded, did the early Christians sincerely believe that Jesus was the Messiah because God had raised him from the dead? And here is how he answered. One good piece of evidence for this is their willingness to suffer terrible persecution and to die for the truth of that belief. And there's the classic apologetic case in a nutshell. And perhaps nutshell is just the right expression. <laughs> well,
Well, Mormon history gives us the tools to refute that claim. Mormon pioneers braved mob violence and aching privation. They struck off time and again into unforgiving wilderness. Many died. They did all these things, even though many of them had been there watching firsthand as Brigham Smith and Brigham Young and Joseph Smith before him made it all up. If today's LDS Church can be accounted for without once imagining that there really were golden plates, then how much more confidently can we suppose that Christianity can be understood without any need to presume that there really was a Jesus, much less that he rose from the dead? Let's sum up. Yes, you can grow a world religion out of absolutely nothing. The fact that it's based on absolutely nothing will not deter early adherents from suffering and dying for it. So the fact that early adherents suffered and died for it is no proof that any religion is true. If that is true for Mormonism, it is no less true for Christianity. Take that, William Lane Craig. And thank you very much. <laughs>